Oh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, British Interplanetary Society's uh, West Midlands branch. Um, uh, welcome to our event uh, this afternoon, our talks. Uh, whoops, here we go. Today's speaker is uh, Rob Swinney from the Initiative for Interstellar Studies. Now, uh, Rob's no stranger to us, uh, or, or and neither is the Initiative for Interstellar Studies. And he's been, uh, he produced a module for the International Space University for their MSc course on, uh, on everything interstellar. And he's been delivering that um, the past uh, month or so. And, uh, and so we asked him to condense his introduction then uh, into, into a half hour talk. He said he'd do his best to me, so it, I know he's been working on a, a number of things uh, for us. He also has compiled a lot of material on advanced propulsion, like nuclear rockets and uh, beam technologies, uh, both uh, solar beams and, uh, and lasers. And, and I, I think uh, it'll be absolutely fascinating to see what he's got for us. And then after the talk, after the, uh, we'll have a question and answer session with him. So today, um, uh, in a moment, I'll be handing over to Rob, and then it'll be simply questions and answers afterwards. Uh, I'll be muting everyone during Rob's talk, and then after, after that, I'll be unmuting everyone. So just, just be careful about that, so <laughs> try not to all speak at once. If you can attract my attention, uh, that would be useful, and then I'll try and, I'll try and coordinate the, the uh, questions and answers at the end. So I'm just going to, without further ado, I'm going to hand control over to Rob, if I can find him here. Uh, here he is. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me all clearly. I'm just going to share my screen. to should show the slides. I've only got 340 to go through <laughs> now. Now I've obviously tried to slim them down a bit. There's a two week uh, module we do with the Interstellar, uh, with the um, International Space University. And uh, we've just done a week full on of remote lecturing. So six and five hours a day is um, quite hard work. And there's definitely quite hard work without the fun of, of a visit to Strasbourg, which uh, sort of makes it all worthwhile normally. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to race through I had, it's quite a few slides but not as many as I mentioned earlier uh, mainly um, to fill in some gaps but there will be some repeats from the one visit I had to the West Midlands branch um, a couple of years ago. So that's the mission for I4IS we're really a, like effectively almost a spin-off from the British Interplanetary Society which uh, has done so much for the space uh, the future of space and, and, and just keeping so many people informed and interested in space. And that's primarily what we want to do in terms of interstellar. Um, the key thing about the BIS and us is I always try to explain to people is we definitely, as a, as a, the human race tend to look on very short timescales. We don't think what is possible or achievable in the, in the longer timescales. And one of my colleagues, Terry, his, uh, his grandmother was alive for the Wright Flyer in 1903, and she also saw the moon landings in 69. Uh, so if you imagine in one lifetime, maybe the lifetime of Captain Tom or, or, or Colonel Tom or whatever he is now, uh, in 100 years, you can make go from two guys messing around in a bicycle shed with uh, tubes and uh, canvas to a 450 ton in orbit space station. So it's just amazing what you can achieve in long time scales. I didn't mention this last time, but some of the outreach we do for this, this last two summers, we've done some at the Royal Institution where we're teaching school kids 13 to 15 and 16 and 17 about interstellar studies. But we go as, 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 as low, down a level as we can do to talking about comparing stepping off a skateboard and that the skateboard going one direction and you go in the other direction how we go all the way up there from that from to to, to, to a rocket in space and try to sort of bring them along the, the the journey as it were through that and so it's a very enjoyable time and great fun with with young kids when they're so enthusiastic so we did the last two years this year is on hold because of the situation but we we wait to hear so what do we normally cover with interstellar studies in space propulsion, I won't talk about chemical necessarily because you all know about that. We tend to focus on some near-term credible options. And as Bob mentioned, sales and fusion and fission fusion are the aspects that I get most involved with, mainly because I feel they're credible in my lifetime. That's the, that's the thing I think about. If we think about starships in our lifetime, that's what I tend to think about. Maybe we can achieve something through those activities. 
the other ones on that those two lists the left hand side top left hand side you know that will form part of the solution for the solar system i suspect i'm not quite sure what of how much but that will be part of the solution the bit on the right hand side from negative energy downwards i tend to leave for the far futurists because uh, you know it's very speculative um at the moment but we look at the physics we look at the engineering we look at the economics to see whether what we can do is achievable now last time i was with you so some of you will have seen this is this image from hubble which I show because it sort of gives you an example of how poorly we can see stuff even in our solar system with the best orbital telescopes we've got. And it wasn't until we had the flyby from New Horizons that we actually got some decent images. And even more, you know, you looked close in and there's a lot more photographs you can go and see them absolutely amazing of, for example, mountains, um, uh, ice mountains and uh, nitrogen glaciers and, and this boiling or roiling sort of porridge of something down in that uh, that, that uh, right hand picture there absolutely incredible and of course that wasn't all we saw with the fly past it went past so it showed us some actual pictures of the moons of pluto which we could barely see before and they were going to go deeper into the kuiper belt and look at another object didn't even know at the time until they discovered that uh, ultimate ultima thule it was called originally now i believe um Arakos or something is the, the name they've given it. And these two bodies have just obviously just gently touched and coalesced slightly and have probably been like that for perhaps billions of years since the formation of the solar system. So that's an illustration from Hubble on Pluto, one you might not have seen. Uh, you don't have to shout out, of course, but anyone can figure out what this image might be. The best shot of something in the solar system. Well, this is actually Ceres in the, uh, in the asteroid belt. So it's a dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. And recently we had the Dawn spacecraft go into orbit around it and show these amazing images. And, uh, you know, we, there was just, we knew some of these things because we could test the, the light from Ceres, but we didn't know the detail until we were in orbit around that body. So it really makes a, a case for actually visiting some of these places. And that mission was a combined mission with a trip to Vesta, one of the large ast asteroids in the belt, and um, obviously the series. So why do I, I raise that? We like to think of some of these things as like precursor interstellar missions. And what do I mean by that? Well, typically, we usually first off speak about long distances and going a long distance. Um, that seems to be the key, obviously, with interstellar. But we also talk about developing new technologies and you notice with the uh, the uh, dawn flight that was obviously an iron drive rather than your normal chemical rockets much more efficient um, thrust is much lower so it's only useful in space really um, but much more efficient than than carrying tons of of perhaps chemical propellant with you and that's some of the things we think about when i go back to my early days in my life when the, the the solar system was just the nine planets pluto was one of the planets at the time but so much has changed since then in terms even terms simple as <laughs> astrobiology we know that many of these bodies may well have oceans under a frozen surface we might there might be you know there <clears> might be other forms of life there that we don't know about and and then this diagram i think it's even more than that it suggests there's 50 dwarf planets around the size of pluto in uh, the Kuiper belt so there's a lot more to see so that leads me to wonder what could we achieve now in terms of a deep interstellar mission well fortunately someone's already done that for us and I'll bring them up this is the Keck Institute for Space Studies so this was a, a venture joint venture between JPL and Kate Caltech and I think they got 24 million dollars over an eight-year period to build up an organization and run these workshops on all sorts of things, but one, the two one week workshops where they looked at what might be achievable with the best chemical rocket technology that we've got now in terms of uh, going into deep, deep space. And you recognize some of these people, I don't know, it, let me just get the laser pointer up and running. Ralph McNutt always seems to be around in these discussions. If you've ever come across him, Phil Lubin, if you've Ever been seen Breakthrough Starshot? Um, Ed Stone, very, very famous from his earlier work with the um, 
Voyager with the NASA, Claudia McCone, yeah, always going on about deep space. And I think one of their interesting guys, Les Johnson at the back there from uh, Marshall, NASA Marshall in Huntsville, Alabama, once had the title of, a job title of manager of interstellar propulsion or something. It was a fantastic job title, I seem to remember. It doesn't do that role now, but uh, brilliant. <laughs> So they were thinking, what can we do? What can we try and solve this problem with what we have available? And they came up with a mission. And this is a, an overview of the mission. You know, they're going to fly around the Earth and uh, do a, an in-space uh, burn just to come back to the Earth and fire out to Jupiter again and then drop right down into the gravity well of, of the Sun. And if you've heard of the O-Birth maneuver, the idea is that the perihelion, the nearest point to the Sun, they would then light up an extra rocket and that actually gives you the benefit of extra delta V and uh, you can leave the solar system at a, a much greater rate than you normally could. So that was the plan they came up with and it looked a bit like this, the, the sketch. So it's a three-stage vehicle, um, the deep space maneuver stage, the perihelion kick stage and the probe. And the probe mass was on the order of a New Horizons uh, type probe. So they obviously had that in mind. So what were they aiming for? Well, they're hoping to achieve the figure of 200 astronomical units, not in the 40, 50 years that will take Voyager, but in 10, 15 years. And I love the optimism of the Americans because they even decided to put it on an SLL, SLS uh, rocket. Who knows when that will be ready? Um, but there you go. That was 2015. Finally, uh, that's been updated. I'm pretty sure it's just an update of that original workshop uh, work that uh, Johns Hopkins University, APL, have updated that, and Brandt and McNutt have written these two articles. I think they're basically the same information. If you can get the JBiz version, that's an update of that last work to go 1,000 AU in, uh, you know, in 50 years, effectively. Build a pro that could last 50 years and go there and they suggested one other thing which was to visit or fly past and i have no idea how you're supposed to properly pronounce this coror which is a kuiper belt object which would be in exactly the right direction that they wanted to do because of their mission design so to try and convince people of why we should do these things these are like steps for us to an interstellar mission what can, how can we justify doing sort of these things? There's always money counting to do. There's always thinking of why we should do this. Or what's the science return? Well, there's still a lot of science return because if you think about it, we've got two data points from uh, Voyager, effectively, of our way out of the solar system. And if you look at this, this, can you see it? That's the direction that the sun is traveling in. And you can see this uh, band of energetic neutral atoms around here and you can see some of these objects from the Kuiper belt that are nearby that we could actually visit on the way past. Could we have a impactor or something like we've done before elsewhere in the inner solar system? What, what could we do? At least we'll have an extra data point as well. Okay, so there are these questions about the heliosphere. So that's this bubble around the sun, created by the solar wind, the gas outgassing effectively of the sun, creates a bubble pushing its way through the interstellar medium. And we think, from the information from Voyager 1 and 2, that there's this bow wave in front of us. It's been the material's been squashed up, just like a boat going through the, the sea or whatever, pushing it. In fact, if you look at the right-hand picture, that's a real picture of uh, LL Aranis, and you can see that, that that effect actually happens. We don't know exactly what that it looks like for the uh, sun, but it's out there somewhere. And there's all this information from these different regions they describe at the end of the heliosphere, which we would love to know more about. And there's that band of uh, energetic neutral atoms. No one has an explanation for that. It's over three, three billion either kilometers or miles, I forget now, three billion in length. It's a long, long, um, ribbon. So there is information we could find out and more in terms of the pristine interstellar medium. If we can get to 200 astronomical units, there's all this information. I won't go through all of it, but you can read that list there. Definitely need to know about the interstellar medium dust, because if we're going to go out there, we might be interested in some of these other things like cosmic rays. We know that high energy cosmic rays get through the heliosphere, get down to Earth. 
but we have no idea really about the percentage or the detail of the lesser energy um, cosmic rays outside of that sphere of protection from the sun. So lots to do. And as I mentioned, Claudia McCone always likes to talk about getting to the focal gravity lens point of the sun. This is because of, uh, you know, gravity bends light. Uh, we know that from Einstein. If you can get to about 550 AU, that's the focal point of the sun. And in theory, you see the factor of amplification is just, just huge, 10 to the power eight. So you imagine you had a telescope at that point on the opposite side, say to Alpha Centauri system, then you could get a massive increase in the, in the ability to view that system from inside our own system, solar system. So that could be a precursor mission. And if we could get beyond 550 AU, well, I would say the world's our oyster, but it's more than that even. If you can imagine, this is the Kuiper belt now that we're in at the moment. That is the little blue square or rectangle you can see right in the center of the Oort cloud, which is believed to be a cloud of comets uh, left over from the formation of the solar system. And we sort of know they're out there. We've never seen any of them. We know they're out there because of the long period comets that come into the solar system. And we know from their trajectories, that's where they must have originated from. So another target, but we're now talking tens of thousands of AU distance. Also out there is um, what I see nomad planets or, or rogue planets. They might be planets that were ejected at the formation of a solar system. Some figures suggest that 100,000 Pluto and larger sized objects for every main sequence star out there. So there's just a huge number. In fact, they could stay warm, some suggest, for one to five billion years. So in theory, you know, the astrobiologists think that what, who knows what might be there, or, you know, it would be, there would be another place to, to, to visit. And there really are free floating. This is an image of a free floating planet. Um, I think there's like a dozen that have been spotted in reality, but uh, there's these micro lensing events. So who knows what's causing them um, that to come up? There may be many, many, many more, but they really do exist. And so by this time, we've come to the edge of the sphere of the sphere of influence of the sun. And we're right now on our way to the nearest star. So if we could get to the nearest star, for example, Proxima Centauri, you know, we believe that's gravitationally bound to Alpha Centauri A. Um, then that would be our first target, I would suspect. Uh, we now know there's a, a terrestrial planet there. We believe there's a gas planet as well. The terrestrial planet is likely tidally locked to the star, so it may not be habitable, but we'd still be a very interesting place to, to visit. And even beyond that, of course, we then have the, the local region. We've got these gas clouds that, you know, this, it's done on this image, this, this artist's image, but we don't really know a lot of detail about these. These gas clouds are made up of just slightly more denser regions of either neutral hydrogen or, pro or, or sometimes ionized hydrogen, i.e. protons and their electrons. So they, they, there's two, two or three types of clouds. And we don't know whether, for example, that um, just if you can see Alpha Centauri there, we don't really know whether that's in the G cloud or not. And unless we go out there, we'll probably never know. And why does that matter? Well, some people think, well, if you used a, I don't know, a ramjet, you can collect material on the way, but what happens if that material runs out before you get to Alpha Centauri, you've got issues. Or if you use a magnetic uh, sail as a drag to slow yourself down and the density suddenly goes from one density to a much lower density, then your sail is going to work much less efficiently. So that's out to the local region. Let's just ponder the question. I, I grew up with the original series Star Trek, okay, and the only planets were in science fiction. And you never went down with your red shirt with Captain Kirk because it, you knew he weren't coming back again. But we didn't know. We even thought the solar system might be just a one-off. You know, we literally did not know about the formation of the solar system properly. But we now know through, the, through a heavy planet with its gravitational influence on the star, makes the star wobble in the sky ever so slightly because they're going around a common center of gravity rather than the center of the star. And by watching that star, if it comes towards us or away from us, 
we can see the spectral lines change. So we know there's a heavy object, we can work out the period, we can work out all sorts of information from that. And we know planets exist from that effect. We even have now these minor eclipses, tiny eclipses. If a planet happens to be aligned with us and it goes in front of its star, then it will very slightly lower the uh, luminosity of the star, just by a small amount. It might only be a 1% or 2%, but a small amount as it transits across the star, and then it would go back up again to its normal thing. And by doing that with the, the Kepler mission and now TESS, uh, Terrestrial Exoplanet Survey Satellite, we can see these, and it's, it's, it's revealed just so many exoplanets, it would have been unbelievable just a few years ago. We're talking of the range 4,000 and um, over that, and they estimate, well, it says 100 to 400 billion exoplanets in the, I think that might be an underestimate. If you're talking of the size of a dwarf planet like Pluto in the solar system, it's just a huge, huge number. This comment says 300 flights, uh, light years. I don't, I'm not sure that's quite correct because I think Kepler quite often picked up a lot that were like a thousand light years away. So it's only a small region of the galaxy that we've actually monitored, but we can see plenty of exoplanets out there. And here's a sort of description of, of what they might be. The Earth type rocky planets compared to sort of ice giants like Neptune. They could be water worlds, they could be frozen, or you've got the hot Jupiters or the cold gas giants up here. Obviously, the period determines distance from the sun, and uh, the temperature is along the, the axis. Uh, sorry, the size is along the axis. You know, I can't see with my glasses on. Can you believe that? So that means there are lots of um, rocky planets uh, nearby, as well as uh, uh, far, far away. But I just want to remind you about one thing about the scale of the problem. Most of you will appreciate this, I'm sure. The scale of the problem is just huge. So the Earth is one astronomical union away. This is a logarithmic line along here. So the Saturn is at 10 astronomical units away, approximately. The edge of the solar heliosphere is 120, something like that, 1,000 AU. 10,000 AU, we're in the Oort cloud and the local uh, cloud. 100,000, not much there. Alpha Centauri system is at 270,000 astronomical units. So I don't know where you are, but if you can imagine pacing one long step, which is about a meter, and you did that two or, you know, two or three times a year, which is the speed of New Horizons or Voyager type spacecraft, it's going to take you 75 years, 75,000 years to get to Alpha Centauri. It's phenomenal. Even just going, I don't know, 30 paces to Neptune, it's still going to take you 10 years at that speed at least. So it's just a long, long way. And we always hark back to the ILD rocket equation. I always put this up here. Don't want to scare people too much, but you know, the other one I use is E equals MC squared. Everyone seems happy with that. Well, look, the same principle, we need to talk about the rocket equation, which describes your delta V, your changing velocity of your rocket, which is related to the exhaust velocity of your rocket, times this function here, which is a log natural, just a mathematical function that says, do something with this fraction in the middle here. And this is a sometimes called the mass ratio, and this is the initial mass over the final mass. It basically tells you how much fuel or you've burned to go from here to your cruise speed. The problem with the log natural, the math math mathematicians will tell you, is there's a law of diminishing returns. You can keep adding and adding fuel, but this log natural of it just doesn't go up much. Eventually, you're wasting your time adding more and more fuel. So people look at changing the exhaust velocity as a means to increase the uh, delta V of your rocket. So simple as that. Idealized equation, but illustrates very well what we need to do. So people target the exhaust velocity. Here's some examples. These are a list of things. They're all compared to nuclear fission. So if one unit was a nuclear fission, the energy from uh, nuclear fission, you can see chemical is tiny. Fusion is 10 times antimatter a thousand times. So that's the limit of, of what we can do with a rocket. There are other options that don't use propellant like sails and ramjets collect it on the way. And then there's other drives that I'm not gonna go into today, which uh, use other forces. 
but this is the critical thing. If we talk an exhaust velocity, this is the typical exhaust velocity from these rockets. Now, these are real practical figures down to about here, and pretty much these are theoretical figures, figures for fission onwards, or I, I would say at least I idealized this might be the maximum without taking any efficiency <clears> into <throat> account. I think if you look at the Daedalus project, they looked at 10,000 kilometers per second for their exhaust velocity. And this specific impulse, I know there's going to be a few people throw their hands in the air at this moment, no, not too many, that uh, I talk to a lot of Americans, so they, all, they always use specific impulse in seconds. And I believe that's so we don't get our, our you know, we don't mix up kilometers and miles, but you never know, that might just be the Americans. But you calculate the exhaust velocity in this situation by using the specific impulse, and that's the force of gravity. That should be G naught, the force of gravity on the surface of the Earth, approximately 10 meters per second squared. So can we improve on chemical rockets? It looks like ions and plasma might do. So one of the plasma rockets that they discussed, it's gone very quiet recently, so I'm not sure what the latest status is, but they looked at, uh, this is a bit like an ion drive, so you ionize your propellant, and then you have to pump more energy in using basically what's like a, a very um, powerful microwave. The thing about the grids in an ion drive, you put that much energy in, they would just melt the, the, your grid. So you need to find some other way. And they, a Vasimir would use a magnetic nozzle and just squirt the energized plasma out the back end. And we're talking maybe compared to chemical of 500 seconds, we're going up to thousands of seconds. So much more... Um, efficient you know nuclear fission would be even more uh, powerful and efficient but still actually it turns out not enough for interstellar so i'll just breeze over that for now so we tend to focus around the nuclear fusion i know we can't quite do it on earth yet but we know it works uh for various reasons the sun in our reactors so we know it's possible and that's just a combination of joining protons together to form helium and by doing that you, they actually lose a bit of mass and that mass is converted to energy which you're going to use in your rocket so very straightforward and it, we know it happens the engineering is just rather tricky could we use antimatter well antimatter seems quite difficult if you look at the cost of antimatter so the, we've generated less than a gram apparently of antimatter in all the time we've been doing experiments and it's co it would cost in the order of trillions per gram to produce. And the calculations suggest you'd need about 100 to 1,000 tons of antimatter to get going to the right speeds to go to Alpha Centauri. So at the moment, that seems most difficult. So people were thinking about some of these objects. But let's go back a little step, and we just go back to, we know how a nuclear bomb works. Can we just lob it out the back of our spacecraft and use the explosion of the of the of the bomb. I'll now from now on call it a nuclear unit that will push on the pusher plate and just push us along. It's been tested. Look, in fact, here's a test you can see online. That is only chemical units, not anything else. Anything else. So the principle works quite clearly. And 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 some paper design suggested this might be able to get to three percent of the speed of light. Now we get. Now we're talking. But if we're still looking at um, in the solar system, this is a design from the very famous film 2001 A Space Odyssey, and this uses magnetically confined fusion, so a bit like a tokamak that you'll be filling with, with the reactors. And um, that was the design that Arthur C. Clarke came up from the, for the movie. You'll notice it's very different from what you might do in real life because a guy called Craig Williams and his team from Glenn in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, actually did the work to design something as close as they could to Discovery and uh, came up with this design. So magnetically confined fusion still, here's the reactor down the bottom end. Now we have radiators, which obviously you will not know, but you know, you will know, should I say, there's a lot of waste heat with nuclear physics, uh, nuclear fusion, for example. So you have to get rid of that waste heat sometime, and that's what the radiators are for. In fact, you'll find that um, there was none on the previous uh, thing because uh, Stanley Kubrick didn't want wings on the spacecraft because of the uh, issues with making it look like a plane. The alternative to magnetically confined fusion is inertially confined, and these are inertially confined fusion, and these are pellets, and this is the National Ignition Facility, which is the size of an aircraft hangar or bigger, where they're going to shine very bright lasers into this hole room, 
which contains a capsule of fuel, deuterium and tritium. And by impacting on the outside of this gold hole room, will create lots and lots of X-rays, which will then impinge on the capsule and cause that to fuse. Now that works in practice in a small way, but it's a five hour turnaround time. And you at the moment actually get out less energy than you put in with the lasers. So there's still work to be done in terms of inertial confinement. But people still think about them. I'm not going to go through all these, but there's some more you can look up here. There's Orion, there's Vista, there's a Buzzard Ramjet I'll mention briefly. Dayless, I'll say a few more words about. Ensman and something called Longshot. So you can check up those if you want to. But I'll mention Dayless because it's a BIS project. That is inertially confined fusion. And it's a small project. Uh, the thing is, it only needed 50,000 tons of fuel. And the challenge there, obviously be launched, built and launched in space, is just ginormous with all that fuel. But effectively, there's a pellet in here that will be injected into this chamber, hit by electron beams, in fact, used by Daedalus, and that would cause it to fuse. And then you use the power from that explosion to be exhausted out, out the bottom, and away you go. So 30 years after uh, Daedalus, we created Project Icarus to update Daedalus. Daedalus takes all the credit for being the most detailed spacecraft design I've probably ever been done. So always worth looking up the, the Daedalus project. Icarus tried to update it. In the end, came up with five different variants. I'll only talk about one variant, and that was Icarus Firefly, because that became the most developed and also used a different form of fusion. In fact, Firefly is just going to squeeze a plasma down here to conditions of fusion. Now you say, well, how can that possibly work? How can you get that to work? And it's quite a natural effect. If you pass a very large current through a conductor, there is a natural inward force that squeezes on it. I think it's the Lorentz force, it was Maxwell's equations. And that's shown by this copper pipe here that's been hit by a, a st strike of lightning, not obliterated, just collapsed. A bit uneven in places, but it's collapsed and it's quite a force. So if you put enough current through your plasma, in theory, you can squeeze it enough for fusion. And I think Shumlak from Washington State University and, and guys from um, Huntsville, the uh, Marshall Space Center, designed variants of this uh, theoretical engine. So we did as well. Some guys came up and it's actually quite a sophisticated, and some people may not think so, Excel spreadsheet there's pages and pages that go into this and you know they split that up into segments they did all the calculation i won't go through any of the numbers on here but just to show you that there was a lot of work that went into that and we ended up with this uh, there's the prototype effect the concept design here's the final design and these orange things on here are the huge radiators required and we estimated that's the temperature that'd be so they look sort of orange color to lose all that waste heat we are talking i think it was over 200 gigawatts of waste heat that had to be uh, offloaded effectively. So just for Firefly and just for one system, I'll talk briefly about the uh, phase change radiators which designed to, to actually get rid of that heat. Effective phase change, a liquid metal is in the parts here and that is vaporized or turns to a gas and is actually drawn up by the pump up through the fins where it cools and when it's cooled into a liquid, it just pumped back into the, um, the radiator system. It's just like an air conditioning unit on an incredible scale. And uh, that was also protecting, for example, the uh, set, uh, superconductors, which are going to create your magnetic field. And that has the secondary cooling system made from liquid nitrogen coolant. So that all works together. And that was done by a guy who works as a professional thermal engineer who certainly knew his beans and created this system, which is, is just incredible to go through the details. We haven't got time for that now. So thinking of alternatives, well, we mentioned magnetic confinement fusion. This is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor in the south of France. And this is the size of the facility we need for, for an uh, MCF. So it would appear tricky to fit that into a spacecraft. I've recently been to Tokamak Energy in Oxfordshire, who have now built a building, a four meter size torus, and it's quite a spherical torus, which they think 
because they're using high temperature semiconductors, they're, they're getting much closer to a, a profitable system than perhaps this sort of, this sort of ITA and the future demo would be in the, in the future. Just incredible. I am flying now to finish on time. There is solar sales. I won't say much more other than, you know, if we can use the photon pressure, this is not the solar wind, this is the photon pressure from the, uh, from the sun, you can actually get a spacecraft to be pushed by that pressure. And this was done by JAXA, the Japanese agency, and just by changing the reflectivity by LCDs on the, on the sail, they could control the spacecraft, the, sh the sailcraft. In fact, some people have suggested, if you think about the sun, you've got enough maybe to go to a precursor interstellar probe or you know, in, in the solar system. But if you go further than that, you'll need to have a dedicated light system. They suggested lasers. And Bob Forward was famous for a lot of things, but he also did a lot of work on lasers. And I'll just mention him here because he came up with this, dear, dear 10 year one way, 1,000 ton payload and crew to the nearest star system, and we're able to decelerate by allowing the center part of this sail to pop out. And effectively, the laser beam of the main sail, which continues onwards, would then be reflected onto the secondary sail and actually bring it to a decelerator into the target system. Big challenge there, 10 to the 7 gigawatts. I lose track of what word that would be, but it's a lot of, a lot of watts. It, almost impossible. He obviously thought the same because in 1985 came up with another idea using microwaves to do a one-way system, four gram payload, and now with a wire mesh because you only need a wire mesh for, for microwaves. And suddenly, even if you using the same size lens, just 10 gigawatts microwave. i f did a project called Andromeda, which is our ver version of a very light sail to go to uh, the nearest stars and we were asked to do that by some organization we didn't know the name of and we did that in February 2016 and we thought we were very proud of the fact the first version came in at 420 grams the second version at 23 grams we were celebrating but little did we know that they wanted to go even smaller and this was breakthrough starship of course and it was Pete Warden here who'd been asking us to come up with this design now they came up with a version, but they were going to use Earth-based lasers, whereas our version used a space-based laser. That's their, that's their solution. Mainly for timescales to be done quicker. They felt they'd be able to do it much quicker if they use ground-based lasers rather than space-based lasers. That is Yuri Milner, and you'll probably know Mark Zuckerberg. And trends make it possible. They might, you've got increasing power for lasers, decreasing costs, they're expen exponential, so that's good news. And they plan to do a two minute acceleration time, one gram spacecraft. This value here is about 20% of the speed of light and do a launch every day. All the costly power and infrastructure is now down on the earth. It's gonna save a fortune, make it so much more easy. It's still challenging. And it means you can fire as many of these very small and cheap uh, craft as you, as you want to. You also have to miss all the satellites and any aircraft that might be passing over. So there is safety issues. And if you want to go online, you can see the 19 challenges they identified that had to be solved. And they're still struggling with a few of them. Um, but you can go online and see exactly what they're working on. That's happening right now. Yuri Miller said he would put $100 million into this project over 10 years. Just a phenomenal amount of money when we used to scratch along with just ideas and paper and paper studies. So that's the two options really that I see credible. The fusion drive, if we can get it working. If someone fixes it on Earth, a reactor on Earth, some crazy English person or someone around the world, should I say anybody around, a, a, a hobbyist will come along and try and fit that to a, a, a spacecraft. Maybe sales will get us the first images back from the nearest stars. And I'll just whiz over, of course, the speculation for the future. Can we use the fact that you can bend space time? And this is a gravitational lensing effect around here that you can see here. Can you bend space time? Can you build a warp drive? And people have, like Alcubierre have come up with a mathematical consistent design where you can squeeze space at the front, expand it at the back. So without breaking the speed limit going through space, you can bend space time enough 
that you could get where you want to go in much quicker times. You only need things like negative energy, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing too difficult to, to get that to work. And you end up with that diagrams like I saw, or even my uh, original enterprise, which is a, another version of that from there. And finally, well, I'll skip over. Oh, I'll just show you, this is in theory, what they think it might look like as a spacecraft going faster than the speed of light goes in front of the earth. This is what you might view. Obviously slowed down a lot because light goes around the earth seven times a second. But that's what they thought you might see with the, the distortion from that uh, space time. Could we use a black hole evaporator? So this is just like large Hadron Collider ring here, particle accelerator. Generate small black holes in the center here and eject them or actually use the energy from the evaporation, should I say, to, to, to drive your spacecraft. And the last slide, futuristic slide, to try and finish on, or two, sorry, on time, is can we use wormholes? Einstein's theories allows wormholes, which might go punch a hole through space and come out somewhere else in space. And if it happened to be somewhere you wanted to go, instead of going all the way around this curved bit of space time around here, you could just pop through the center. Some requirements, well, you can read those yourself. And um, I, I, not in my lifetime, I don't think. Could we go, could we go uh, build a time machine using these things? In theory, yes. So if you built your time, your wormholes, when it started off close together, and one of the wormholes went off in a spacecraft traveling close to the speed of light, so there's a time dilation effect. Effectively, if it returned to Earth, the two ends of the wormhole would be at different times. In theory, if you could get through one, you could change, um, you could uh, travel through time effectively. Whew, that last bit was rather rushed. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll just finish off by saying, there is a long history of people trying to think of how to do interstellar travel, and there's a lot of ideas. Problems seem challenging, but the things I've discussed in terms of sales and, and fusion and fission fusion, there, there is nothing to stop us doing that. It's just going to take a bit of engineering, a bit of time, I suspect. No physical barriers. And I mentioned I4IS again. That's just the mission. And we are all inspired by people like um, Alan Bond, who's gone and spent his career trying to do the stepping stones. One of the first steps is an easy, easier access to space and designing this uh, Sabre engine. And hopefully one day we'll have cheap access to space. So I apologize for running slightly over. I've got a bit of time this afternoon to take questions. Um, Bob, shall I hand back over to you? Yes, please, thank you. Okay. Let's see what we've got here. Okay. That okay. must have raised a few questions. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, Rob, brilliant talk, as always. I'm going to unmute everyone now. Um, might fall on you, Bob, then, as the host, to ask the first question. <laughs> um, oh, oh, gosh, right. Um, no, well, you, I, you've, talked, you've talked about so much, I'm not quite sure where to start. Um, all right, uh, we have good, we've got one in. Um, uh, so this is uh, Peter Robinson. So you haven't mentioned Mike McCullough's uh, QI drive. What are your thoughts on that? I didn't. And I sat through his lecture, I think, about a year or so ago and thought, and this is all I remember, thinking that sounds like it's not going to work. But I am very, despite all of this discussion we've just had this afternoon, I'm quite the skeptic on a lot of these things. And I was a bit skeptical and I haven't seen or thought much more about it since then. So I can't really fill you in any more, any more details. That's from a question from Peter about Mike McCulloch's QI drive. Uh, so I don't want to step out of line and make a comment on it other than I was skeptical at the time. Has anyone got any comments from the floor about the QI drive or any other further questions? Sorry, Peter, that wasn't a great answer. I, I would say that I, I, I skipped over quite a few other options that might be possible in the future. So um, that I will have missed a number. Uh, if you think about the, that that slide I did about four or five in that had the list of all the energy sources or the options of space propulsion, then um, there's all those variants of, uh, and variants of hybrids that could be, could be a solution. 
Um, I've got one. Um, you, you mentioned you went to have a uh, look at the Tokamai uh, fusion reactor down in Oxford, the, the, yeah. spherical, the spherical fusion reactor. So, uh, I think we, we were there when we, we heard uh, a paper on that last summer. And um, I understand it was, um, it was, it's actually quite small. Um, how small is it? And is it something that's launchable? So the one I saw was 2.5 metres tall. And they plan to build one that's four meters tall. So in, in our the scope of out the things we discuss, that's relatively small. Now, I think from my, what I remember from the visit and from thinking afterwards, the four meter one, if there's a positive um, energy outcome, then that would be feasible to fit on a large spacecraft. But uh, I, I, I I wouldn't like to say exactly the performance of it in that case. I think they were saying that that might produce positive out, uh, positive um, energy out rather than the amount going in. So the one I saw, 2.5 meters tall with a bit of ancillary stuff around it. They're talking about this four meter tall version that was going to produce, they thought, produce electric, more electricity coming out than going in. Their secret, if you're wondering why the difference between the like the tokamaks at ITER and others, which are more, if I put it extremely, are more like a car in a tube torus type style, um, tokamak energy were making it very spherical. So that if you could cut through it, it looked like two Ds stuck together as much as anything. And that was one thing they thought helped their system. But also they were operating with what they call high temperature uh, superconductors. So instead of having to cool down to about four Kelvin, four degrees Kelvin, if I miss say it, but four Kelvin, they were thinking they could operate at 20 Kelvin. And in terms of these super frigid temperatures, that's actually quite a big advantage in a system. It may not seem like it to us, but instead of having to cool down to 4K, where you need liquid helium, they could get down to their soup, their, their, their uh, conductors could operate at 20 Kelvin. So that's what I remember. In terms of its performance in a rocket, I didn't sit down and say, uh, in fact, I do remember asking the guy there, I said, if you ever put that into a rocket or figure out how you can do that, let me know. And he hadn't, didn't ever get back to me. So, um, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good, excellent. Um, you mentioned, of course, uh, Project Daedalus uh, from 1978. And um, I believe the BIS republished it uh, within the last five years, I think, um, with some updates in it. I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that. I haven't, I've got the original document, <laughs> which I bought at the time, believe it or not. Um, and, um, but I haven't got the second, re uh, second version, so uh, I haven't been able to do a comparison, but um, I was wondering if you wanted to make any comment on the republished version. I think, if I recall, didn't they republish all the original papers plus some subsequent ones that Alan Bond and people like that had written into a book format, mm -hmm. which I think is either available from Lulu or, or from the BIS, which, mm -hmm. which, which is a brilliant, if you, want to, if you want to learn about Project Daedalus, and like I say, most people say it's probably the most uh, comprehensive design for an interstellar spacecraft. You know, you say that in NASA, they still don't correct you, so uh, it must be quite good. And although our work with Icarus Interstellar approached it in many areas, it, it, if we matched it anywhere, I'd be very, very happy. And maybe Firefly did in, in places. But the Daedalus book, with all the papers and subsequent analysis that went on, can be found in that, that publication, either through Lulu or perhaps through the BIS Direct. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Mark. Hello, Mark. Hi, Rob. Um, did you see the um, the announcement in Aviation Week uh, December last year of uh, an American program to build uh, fission reactors sized for ISO containers using pelleted fuel? So the so the what they're looking at is one to ten megawatts of power being produced from a, a shipping container. Um, you remember the sort of mass of that shipping container with the, did they, the you know, sort of the specific power from that app, from that system? Uh, no, there, there wasn't a huge amount of details. The the program's due to start 
this year, according to Aviation Week. Um, but uh, I just wondered if you'd come across it and what you thought of, you know, what you thought of, it, of that, um, because a lot of the things that we're, the, the nearer term missions, we need power on the, uh, and, and at the moment we don't have large amounts of power available. No. And I, I, I did, I think I read an earlier discussion about that from one of the companies, which I thought was more like an advertising blurb for them. Don't know how serious they were, but I think there are me, there are people aiming to get these smaller versions, you know, one kilowatt power. I was talking to, you may know Sonny White just last week, and he was saying that they were looking at maybe getting a version that could go up to five megawatts. And if you could have five megawatts of power, you know that you're still limited in the exhaust velocity you're going to get from a fission drive, but in theory you've got lots of power and you can accelerate things either thermally for high thrust or electrically maybe for higher, uh, better performance in terms of the system and exhaust velocity. And I definitely think these things will form, and in fact most likely form, I think nuclear electric will probably most likely form some of the infrastructure we have for the solar system, rather, you know, rather than going meso further afield, but definitely part of uh, the solar system. Um, yes. So I don't know much more detail than that, but that's, that, that definitely feels like me part of the packages for the future. I am just binge watching the expanse at the moment. So if anyone's seen it, don't spoil the plot for me just at the moment. I'm on series two and they obviously uh, have, uh, now in the solar system, in the belt, um, at Mars, and they're hauling ice and stuff from the uh, outer solar system into the inner solar system for, for use resources. And they never quite say what their uh, mechanism is, although they come up with this thing called an Epstein drive at one stage, and I'm not quite sure what they're describing. But I feel, if you imagine that economy, Mars, asteroid belt, inner solar system, I think nuclear electric is very likely to form part of the package of whatever we use in the future and possibly quite soon, you know, cause nuclear thermal was done 40 years ago. You know, it's just got to just bring all that technology together. And uh, in fact, some of you guys on here probably know this better than me. We, we really could see that in the near term if the motivation was there. Okay, well, I think I think that's uh, I think that's uh, that's all the questions. So um, I'd like to I'd like to say to Rob, thank you so much for for uh, uh, do, doing this uh, talk for us today. It's been absolutely absolutely um, uh, enthralling. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, and I knew I would. Um, you all, you always do a good talk. Thank you, Rob. Excellent as always. Cheers. Thanks so much. <laughs>